Good. Well, this morning I am so excited to be able to share the word again with you guys. I, I love getting the opportunity to do this. It's such a privilege it's, uh, and blessing. So if I asked you guys this morning, by a show of hands, how many of you would think it's a good idea to put a winter jacket into a microwave for an extended period of time? <laughs> hey, Rudy has his hands up. But other than that, not many of you. To your surprise, grade nine Nathan and his two friends thought it, it was a fantastic and hilarious idea. This, so, the, so one night, this goes back to grade nine in junior high, one night myself and two of my best friends were at a junior high dance and we were in the coat room taking off our coats, getting ready to go in when a grade seven kid, so much lower on the food chain, right? I mean, he's grade seven. We were, we were grade nines. He comes into the coat room and he proceeds to stuff his jacket into the lunchroom microwave. And as myself and my two friends are seeing this, we're like, what are you doing? Like, why are you putting your jacket in the microwave? And so he sees the puzzling looks on our faces, and he reassures us that this is his best possible idea because the jacket is expensive, and he doesn't want to get it stolen. So this is the very best idea that he could come up with. And so he puts the jacket into the microwave, he closes the door, and he leaves, and the idea had already conspired between myself and my two friends. So sure enough, later in the night, uh, myself and my two friends, we come back to the room, we plug the microwave in, and we turn it on. For six minutes and 50 seconds, this coat was in the microwave, warming, heating. But to my surprise, and to my friend's surprise, at the end of the six minutes and 50 seconds, we take the coat out, we examine it. Now, it's extremely hot. It's, it's very warm. But other than that, other than that fact, there had nothing, nothing had happened. And so, yes, at the, at the same time, we were, still, we were laughing so hard. We thought this was hilarious. But other than that, nothing had happened. So then we decided to put it back in the microwave for the remaining 10 seconds of the original seven minutes that we had set on the microwave. So then we pressed start again, and we left the room and went back to the dance. End of story, right? Yeah, absolutely not. Well, about 10 minutes later, I'm back in the dance. I'm having a good time with my friends, enjoying myself, when one of my friends who was involved in this comes running up to me, and he, and he has this horrified look on his face, and he comes and grabs me and says, Nathan, the coke caught fire in the microwave, and they're looking for whoever did it. I cannot tell you in that moment the amount of how much I saw my life flash before my eyes in that immediate moment. And so as things are unfolding, this is a crazy situation. Myself and my two friends are talking of like, what are we going to do? Like, this is, this is mad. Like, this is ridiculous. And so this is all unfolding. And then the office gets word uh, that we might have done it from other people. And so, of course, they pull us into the office. They sit us down and they ask us point blank, did you do it? Now, myself and my two, my, one of my friends, we sat silent. We, we sat there with our tail tucked between our legs, didn't say a word. But my other friend, he lied our way out of it. Again, end of story, right? Of course not. To simplify the story a bit, we got off scot-free for about a day and a half. But then the office got the bright idea to pull us in one by one by ourselves. And grade nine Nathan could no longer handle the pressure and could no longer maintain the idea that we didn't do it. And so this caught up to us. This eventually caught up to us and we got suspended. We got suspended for, from school for a few days. But then, then my parents found out. And that, let me tell you, that's where the baloney really met the bread. <laughs> I remember being at home, and then the phone rings, and the school called. And I remember my mom answering the phone, and immediately, I knew that tone of voice. Oh, I was in trouble. 
And then it got worse. It got worse. Later that night, I had a hockey game. And so on this particular night, my dad was working later. So he was going to pick me up after the game and my mom was going to drop me off. And I just remember being there with my mom and absolutely pleading with her, begging her, just saying, Mom, can I, can I get a ride home with you? Like, please, I don't, I don't want to ride home with Dad. Like, I should have realized it was a losing battle from the very beginning. And so as the game goes on, I'm on the ice in the net uh, as a goaltender, and the entrance to the arena is right behind me. And I remember during the, the play had stopped, and I just remember turning around, and my dad's there standing behind the glass. And immediately I knew that look on his face. I was in trouble. That car ride home afterwards was probably the longest car ride of my life, let alone maybe the scariest. But aside from that, something that my dad said to me that I've never forgotten and will always remember, he said, Nathan, what made me disappointed and what made me mad is not that you did what you did with your friends, but what made me disappointed and what made me mad is that you went along and you lied. You knew better. Today we're looking at a piece of scripture that I would be one to say relates to this. And because I, I so often find that we know what God has said, and we clearly know it. We've studied the scripture, and we, knows, we know what he says, but we still persist to do otherwise. We want to do what we want to do regardless. We'd rather remain comfortable. We'd rather remain complacent. And that, that grieves God's heart. And yet, it doesn't grieve ours. Before I go any further into what might be a hard piece of scripture to look at, because I'm, I'm in the same boat with you guys, I want to pray, because this morning we need our Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to you and just say thank you. God, that despite everything else, you still love us, and that your rich grace and your rich mercy is new this morning and new every morning for us. God, this morning as we look at your word, will we do so diligently and will we earnestly seek your voice? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be the one to convict, you'd be the one to inspire, the one to guide, the one to encourage. And God, would what we do here this morning be glorifying to you? Would the words from you stick in our hearts, God? And when, then would we actually act on them? Any words that are not from you, would those words just fall away and be unnoticed? God, this morning we give you all the glory because you alone are good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning we are back in the book of Nehemiah, still in our Nehemiah series. And specifically today we're in chapter 8 and chapter 9. So let's go there now, starting at the very beginning of chapter 8, verse 1. So as Ken said earlier, if you don't have a Bible, there is a rack of Bibles at the back. Please, by all means, go and grab one. It's going to be really, really helpful to have it in your hands as we uh, go through these couple chapters today. And if you don't have one for yourself at home, that is our free gift to you. Uh, we want you to take that and then just absolutely fall in love with the Word of God. All right, so chapter 8. Uh, verse 1, and Mark did a really good job earlier with the names that he read. I don't know if I will do as good of a job, but I will try my very best. All right, chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So, the, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it, and he read from it, read from it facing the square before the water gate in the early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, and Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Messiah. On his right hand, Pedadiah, Mishael, 
Melchijah, Hashem, Badani, Zechariah, and Melshem on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jesha, Benai, Sherebiah, Janan, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodadiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. Well, the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave, gave the sense so that the people could understand and understood the reading. So that was a lot. That's okay. We'll do this together. Let's unpack this. First and foremost, I think it would be really, I think it would be super helpful to understand a few key details of what's going on here so that we have a better idea of what they're getting at. And something that needs to be taken into consideration here is this culture's hold and view on the law. Now, to this culture, uh, the law is also known as the Torah, which is the first five books uh, of the Bible. And to this culture, as many before them and then as many others as time would progress, the law was extremely important. It was how they lived their lives. And so to be a, people, to be a group of people who lived against the law or did things against the law, that was a various, very serious thing. But here's the other thing. Because this culture held the law in such high regard, they all would have known it very specifically and if not entirely. And something because of that, something that we need to note this morning is when we're looking at the law in this, in this text, they're not getting at very specific individual laws that we see all the way through the law. But rather what they're getting at here is the covenants, the different laws of the covenants. And all the way through the law, we see so many different covenants. We see the, the, the covenant with Noah, the covenant, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and all of these being super important. And covenants that these people, again, they would have been very familiar with. And so this, this is about how they had gotten away from the law and then how they needed to get back to the law of these covenants. It was about recognizing God's redemptive process. The way he redeemed. The way he intends to redeem. And I love the part that's included here in the text. Let's take a look at it uh, in verse 8 here. Verse 8 of chapter 8, it says, They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. I think that's crucial right there, and I think it's a really cool picture that's painted for us. So Ezra is in front of all the people, huge gathering, and he's reading the law, but then I think, if not just as important, if not maybe more significant, is what happens after that. After Ezra reads the law, everyone, including some of the other leaders, help everyone else understand. They break off into smaller groups so that everyone is on the same page. Everyone understands. And really, if we look at it, we do a very similar thing on Wednesday nights here at youth group. We have one message, we're together, we hear the word, and then we break off afterwards and go to smaller groups to understand to have a fuller knowledge of what's going on and to be on the same page together. This is about community. This is about being together. That we would understand it. We are designed for community. So if you don't understand something, whatever that something may be, I can guarantee you that you're not going to have as much value or as much worth on that thing as if you... Uh, as you would if you actually understood what it was getting at. And so a very basic, simple example of this is if I asked Isaac, who's sitting back at the soundboard, uh, later, later today, that I wanted him to show up at 5.30 on Wednesday to youth instead of 7 p.m., I am almost certain that I wouldn't be able to get away with asking that to him without him asking, Why? 
and simply because he wants to understand the reasoning of what I'm getting at. And so for us today, when we're looking at this piece of scripture, I believe that we can even take it a step further. In my opinion, this this ultimately comes down to understanding the heart of God and who he is. Let me say that again. I think this comes down to, ultimately comes down to understanding the heart of God and who he is. Now, to, to a big extent, we will never be able to fully know and understand God. That, that's not going to happen. God is way bigger than us. He's, he is perfect. He is over everything. He sees everything. So we're not going to come to a, a full knowledge of who he is. But I believe that we can begin to know him and his character from the word. And that is a game changer. And that is a game changer because we will be able to understand the heart of God and what he is, the heart of God and what he's saying because we understand who he is. If I give zero time in trying to get to know God for who he is, not for who I want him to be or not who for what God isn't, But if I give zero time in trying to know God for who he is, there is no way that I will ever be able to understand what he says to me, what he asked me to do, and the ways in which he calls us forward. We will never be able to understand that. Let's keep going here. So the law is read, the people come to a fuller understanding, and then we come to verse 9 here. And Nehemiah, who is the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has, who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Something that you probably don't know about me is that I absolutely love planes. I love aviation. And uh, on my iPad, I have a, a plane tracker app so I can go on it and see all the flights throughout the world and track them and check the different planes and models. Uh, I, I very much, when I'm going on a flight, so this past Christmas when I went home to Halifax and when I came back, I would do my research and check out what type of plane I'm going to be on, what gate it's going to, all of the nitty-gritty details. And so... Uh, so much so that when I'm in Calgary, or when I was in Calgary, I, if I often got a day off, I would go to the airport and I would drive my car to a place where I could see the planes land and then take off. And I could do that for hours. And this plane, this plane right here, oh, back. There we go. It's a small plane. It's a little Cessna plane, but it's a plane nonetheless. And actually, this particular plane, I had the, the joy of going with Matt Rainey for a flight down to Hamilton in the summer. And for me, that was, I, I totally geeked out over that. It was really cool. But then, then we come, now you can go to the next one. Oh. Now we can go to the next slide. There we go. Whoa. Like, that is absolutely massive. And that, that is the Airbus A380, one of the biggest planes in the world. And on this plane, for the first class passengers, if, you so, if they so desire, they can have a shower in a luxury bathroom at 40,000 feet. They can also, if in, during flight they feel tired, and if they so desire, they can turn their seat fully reclined into a bed so that they can lay down. And that's just two features of this crazy monster of an airplane. But I think, despite the size between these two planes, despite how big one is, how small one the, the other one is, and all the other features between them, 
I think at the very least there's two things that these planes share. They both need fuel and they both need a place to land. And I think for us as believers, I don't think it's too much different. It doesn't matter if you've been a believer for eight minutes or 80 years or if you're a spiritual infant or you're spiritually mature, you still need the grace, the mercy, and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The little plane needs to refuel often. Can't go very far before it needs to come down. Needs care. It needs maintenance. And like the little plane, young believers need to refuel and land often for care and maintenance. And then, yes, we come to the Airbus A380, the monster of a plane. Yes, it holds thousands and thousands of liters of fuel. And yes, it can go more than halfway across the world. But it still needs fuel. It still needs to land. It still needs care. It still needs maintenance. Similarly to the mature believer. This is about togetherness. This is about community. We cannot do this alone. And we need to ground ourselves in the truths of Scripture and be fueled by the love of Jesus. Regardless of where we are on our spiritual journey with the Lord. And so come back to, come back to the text and we find the, we find the same thing. And I love this part in Nehemiah. The hearts of the people are finally back, coming back and in tune with God. Together, keep that in mind, not separately. And together, it says, the people here were grieved by the law. They realized how they had moved away from the law, and they realized their sin, and they were grieved because of that. In this moment, they also realized, they realized a few things. They realized that they weren't the judge, And they also weren't the redeemer. But they realized that simply their role was to to be the obedient servant to God and let their heart be grieved by sin. So then this makes me ask the question, is your heart grieved by sin? Ken, it doesn't matter if you've been a believer for eight minutes or 80 years. Does sin grieve your heart? Are we trying to play the role of judge? Are we trying to play the role of redeemer? Are we putting ourselves on pedestals above others? Or are we playing the part that we are asked to play as the obedient servant who lets his or her heart be grieved by sin? Again, this process, this process of being grieved comes from knowing God and knowing his heart. And once again, I love, I love what happens here in this part in Nehemiah and what Nehemiah says. So, so the people are grieving, but Nehemiah says, no, stop. Stop grieving. Move on. Move forward. And I think that's so important. That's a very important thing. Yes, grieving is important, and we are supposed to grieve sin. We are supposed to, our hearts are supposed to be grieved by that, but we're not supposed to stay and keep grieving. The past is the past. Don't remain there. Let it go. But use it as something that propels you and propels us as the body of believers, the body of Christ, forward in our faith. Nehemiah tells the people to stop grieving because they're going to miss out on what God is doing. Do you want to miss out on what God is doing? I don't. So let's go back to the text here. Speed up to chapter 9. We'll come back to chapter 8 in a moment uh, and finish off the last section there. So we come to chapter 9 and we see more spiritual reform, more um, uh, spiritual reform and confession. And we see at the very beginning of 9 here, that they confessed, or that they read the law for a, for a quarter of the day, and then for the rest of the day, they confessed together. They worshiped together. And then I think they come to something else that's very important, that's the prayer. And I want to spend a bit of time here, because I think it's particularly important. So they start going over the history of their ancestors, 
And I think there's something that we need to pick up on in that history because there's a natural pattern. So they're going over it, and we see the natural pattern of people messing up and then coming back to God. Messing up and then coming back to God. Messing up and coming back to God. And these people here in the text at this time, they finally reach a place of saying, okay, enough is enough. We're done with that. It's time for us to finally call sin for what it is, and that's sin. So call sin, sin, and then repent, and seek forgiveness, and then move forward together. That sounds great, right? Totally. That's, that's awesome. But I think, again, for these people here, they recognize the natural pattern. They see it. And so for them, if they're really going to move forward together, they have to engage in a brutally intentional uh, process in this. They have to be intentional with one another as a community and with themselves. So at the end of chapter 9, in verse 38, we see that they went as so far, they got serious about it, and they signed covenants. Are we serious about moving forward? Okay, so let's go back to chapter 8 here. And I want to paint a picture here for you because I think it's pretty substantial. As we read chapter 8, we notice something called the Feast of Booths. Again, here it's, it's really important to understand the historical context of what's going on so that we get a better appreciation and a better understanding of, of what's going on. So the Feast of Booths, what is that? And when, when you dig into it, you find that the Feast of Booths was part of the Old Covenant worship, and it happened at the end of the agriculture season. And the purpose, the purpose was to thank God for the preceding year's provision. But there is another part to it. And as we look back in other parts of the Old Testament, we see that Moses often warned the Israelites that once they got into the promised land, not to just settle in and not to forget the God who had redeemed them from slavery. And so being that a part of Feast of Booths, this was to remember that it was not them. And in the same breath, God who could have likely easily taken this away from them it was not them who did it. And they had to come to that realization because it was so easy for them to just settle in, become comfortable and say, look what we did. Look how we profited. And again, they had to come to this place of realizing that it was not them, that they were not the judge, they were not the redeemer, and now they're not the creator or the sustainer. But again, they are the obedient servant to God. Living in these booths was a reminder that they wouldn't be where they are without the grace and mercy of God. It was God alone who brought them to where they were, and mind you, could very easily change that. And as for the booths themselves, as we dig into it a little bit more, we find out that these were not big by any stretch of the imagination. And even so, not only were they really small, but for this feast, you lived in the booth for an entire week with your entire family. And I don't think many of us could do that today. But, but for this feast, it wasn't something that was done without intention or without purpose. It was, this whole thing was grounded in intentionality. It was an intentional reminder that in order to be redeemed, they had to surrender. That they had to surrender self-reliance, selfishness, and they had to surrender and turn from the temptation of comfort and complacency. But they also had to turn from the comfort and complacency of their sin. As many of you know, I have a car here with me in Sobel, and you'll see it out in the parking lot. It's the one with the Alberta license plate on it. Uh, so this meant back uh, last, uh, in May of last year that I had to drive it across a good chunk of Canada. Now this drive, this drives about 33 hours, give or take, and luckily I didn't have to do it alone. My dad was willing to do it with me. 
And I remember when we were back in Calgary and we were starting to pack my car up with, with different things, we noticed very, very quickly that we're not going to have much space in this vehicle, that it's going to be very tight. And even despite having uh, shipped a couple of things uh, already to, to Sobble here and even having a car carrier on the roof, we were running out of space really fast. And so running out of space really fast, we were like, okay, what... Like, what do we do? We, got, we have to fit everything in. And so we did the only thing that we could, and that was move the passenger seat all the way up, and then the driver's seat all the way up, and then the backs of the seat to more or less a 90-degree angle. And so this, this was not a, a, a comfortable trip by any stretch of the imagination. It, it was brutal. And you'd think the passenger chair was almost more comfortable, and I can guarantee you it wasn't, because the driver, whoever was driving the vehicle, actually needed more room to be able to drive the vehicle. Um, and that being, we were running out of so much room that we had to put a few things on the floor of the passenger side. So again, it, sitting as the passenger, you had two choices. One side, the other side, and your feet didn't move. That was it. So it's like for 33 hours, this is so uncomfortable. And at the end of every day, we would stop for the night at a hotel, and I cannot say how strongly I appreciated that bed when I got to it, that I could stretch out as much as I wanted to, and there was no restriction on that. And let alone, it gave me a brand new appreciation for being able to drive my vehicle without an absurd amount of stuff in it. But this experience forced me to think about comfort and space in a new way. And in the same way, the Feast of Booths was something that demanded the people to be intentional and move forward in their faith. And the, interesting, the very interesting thing that I find here was that this was the particular feast that they chose to write about. They could have written about any number of other ones, but this was the specific one that they chose. And I believe, I believe that they chose this one because it's about moving forward. It's about not being complacent or comfortable. It's about surrender. And so in that, in that idea, those, those raw things, those raw details can be applied to any number of other things and situations. So when we look at it through that lens, it actually can be used for all of us. So this leads me to a question I want to leave you guys with today. What is your, or better yet, what is our Feast of Booths? All of what we've been looking at so far in this whole series is twofold, both for us to be able to examine ourselves as an individual, but also for us to examine ourselves as a, as a body of believers, as the body of Christ. So with that in mind, I ask you, what is your feast of booths? What do you need to move forward from? What do we need to surrender? Nehemiah tells them in the passage to stop grieving because they're going to miss what God is doing. It's the same for us. So like the people in this piece of scripture, we've, we've, we've finally today, we finally come to a place of seeing everything that God has done before us and all the great things and all the awesome things. And in this moment today, right now, it has to start with God. Period. And in that moment, when it's, that it starts with God, we also have to start with how am I going to listen to God and then how am I going to do what he says? And not just remain in one place, not moving forward. This, my, this is a mindset that we have to get, get ourselves in because this mindset continually seeks to move forward in their faith. It says, okay, here's what God has done. That is awesome. That is so cool. I am so thankful. But what am I going to do about it? Something that comes to my mind here and that I'm reminded of is, that the, is what we read at the end of Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The book of Nehemiah starts with Nehemiah and his contrite heart. His heart is grieved. It's cut by, by the, word and, the words and, and God's heart. And then as the book progresses, this spreads to the entire nation. The entire nation is cut and grieved by God's heart and God's words. And to the point where they're crying out confession, they're crying out for forgiveness, they're crying out in worship before their God together 
And most importantly, most importantly, listening to God and what he says and then moving forward. Today for us, I think one of our responses to this has to be to get ourselves into the place where we are grieved by the heart of God. That we are in the same place that we grieve for what God grieves. And how do we do that? I think one of the most basic responses, we have to get in the word. And as we come to Hebrews, as we come to Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. So unlike my coat in the microwave story where I knew better and I did what I wanted to do anyways, how are we going to take what God has said and how are we going to do it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we We come to you and we just ask forgiveness for the times that we have tried to be anything else but your obedient servant. God, we are so thankful for your grace and for your mercy and for your love that you show us when we definitely don't deserve it. God, you are good. Holy Spirit, I pray that again, that you would be uh, the one to do the convicting. You would be the one to do the encouraging and pointing out sin and inspiring Would we let you do your job? Would our pride not get in the way? Would we not get in the way of what you're doing in us? God, this morning we ask your help to really lean into you, to hear your voice, God, and to do what you say. And most importantly, to move forward together. Would we be reminded daily our essential, absolute need for you because we cannot do this without you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that's been a challenge for you this morning. Whatever's holding you back, whatever's, whatever God's bringing to your heart that may be a sin, might be just something that we've, we've, we've dwelled on for too long, that we would surrender that over and give it to God so we can move forward. It's, it's about us, but it's more than that. It's about us moving forward together as community. King David's prayer was, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. He's goes on to say, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Our sin not only affects us, it affects community. And as we release and as we move forward individually, uh, we do that as well as a community. And we're released to see and to experience what God has for us in the future. Let's pray. God, we thank you that uh, your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we know that none of our sins are hidden from you. You see all. We know that it hinders our moving forward, but also those around us and in our community. God, would we be quick uh, to see how your spirit convicts us, be quick to confess Open our eyes to see what you would have for us moving forward. God will give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.